Hello, everyone. I am Stacey Kazanchuk, Genev's Director of Health Coaching and Registered Dietitian, Nutritionist, and Exercise Physiologist. And today I am here with Wendy Ellis, our naturopathic physician who uh, works with Genev as well. And we are going to be talking about fatigue and energy, um, especially right now during this pandemic time. Um, we are hearing a lot from our clients and patients um, and women in general about burnout and fatigue. And so we thought it would be a relevant topic to discuss um, today. And that's what we're going to be doing. So Wendy, welcome. Thank you so much for your time. And um, please introduce yourself to our listeners. Yeah, hi, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Wendy Ellis. I'm a naturopathic doctor here in Seattle and I do telemedicine for Genev. And I've also been working with them on uh, producing some content for those great blogs that you read and some formulations. And later we'll talk about Vitality, which you know we're all looking for a little more energy. So Vitality was created in part because women are constantly feeling tired. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very important topic. Excellent. Well, let's um, jump right in and uh, talk about what you've been seeing in your clients. Um, I can share also with some of the Health Fix clients um, and the pulse of energy levels um, that you've been experiencing. So what have you seen with the clients that, and patients that you've been working with? Yeah, you know, the thing about fatigue is that it just seems like we're all in this period of fatigue right now, um, whether it's COVID fatigue or, you know, that we're working, we're, you know, we're working from home and we're commuting less, but it seems like there's a lot more meetings and a lot of people are busier now than they've ever been and homeschooling children or putting kids on Zoom calls. And so, Obviously, you know, when it comes to fatigue, the first thing that we want to address is like, how is your life playing into that? Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, you know, talking about the lifestyle things, which of course we'll get into um, to help you sort of put a checklist of things that you're doing or not doing or could be doing better. Um, so talking about stress and lifestyle are a really important part of that. And then after we talk about that, we start looking into some physiologic things. Um, mm -hmm. And with menopause, there are so many changes that happen in the body. And I'd say that fatigue is one of the most common things that women experience. And there's oftentimes no tangible thing you can measure in a lab test. It's all, you know, what you're experiencing clinically. And I think it's frustrating for people because they go to their doctor and their doctor's like, well, everything looks great. You know, you just need to sleep enough. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, obviously there's a lot of things with COVID that we're working from home and, you know, our kids are home and, you know, work is often more busy and people have lost jobs. They've lost income. They've lost things to look forward to. And so I think a lot of life is participating in this fatigue that women are experiencing, but even COVID aside, you know, going through menopause creates a lot of fatigue for women and it's involves so many different um, parts of the body that oftentimes it's hard to put a finger on exactly what it is. But hopefully through this conversation today, we can give you an idea of things that you can put in a checklist and determine whether you're doing them or not doing them or determine if you need to go do lab work to determine, you know, things that are physiologically going wrong that you can measure that can help really put a finger on why you're feeling fatigued. Yeah, that's such a good point that there are, it's complicated fatigue, very, um, it's usually never just one single thing that we see. And I think what you also mentioned that I see a lot with my clients is that there's a lot of new things right now. There's a lot of, uh, whether it's homeschool or everything with the pandemic is new for all of us, um, or menopause. Menopause is a new phase of life for so many women. And so there's this level of fatigue around having to embrace and encounter something that that's unfamiliar and uncommon so often and so long now for so many women. Right. And, you know, the most obvious reason for fatigue is lack of sleep, mm -hmm. you know, or lack of restorative sleep. And so, you know, I think some of the most important things to determine is, you know, if it's hot flashes that are keeping you awake, then that's a pretty easy thing that, that you know, you can work with your doctor or with Stacy to figure out like how to control those hot flashes so then you can sleep. Um, but sometimes it's not even hot flashes. It's just a, a change in, 
in your cortisol rhythm. And I think a lot of us with these unstructured days and we're working from home and we can sometimes work whenever we want to, that people are tending to sleep in later and stay up later. And the natural rhythm of cortisol, which is a stress hormone, which is very impacted by menopause because as estrogen and progesterone, testosterone tend to fall at menopause, in some circumstances, testosterone rises, but in turn, what happens is that your cortisol levels can rise. And so when you're trying to go to bed at night, if you've been up working and doing all these things, it's really hard to shut that cortisol down when it should be highest in the morning and decline throughout the day. We're having these lifestyles that aren't really structured. And so structure is a really important part mm. of sleep. And we, you know, we're, we're meant to sleep about seven to nine hours per night. And Sometimes women are, they go through menopause and they're like, wow, you know, I require a lot more sleep and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And I think some of us have shorter circadian rhythms and some mm -hmm. of us have longer circadian rhythms as far as the 24 hour cycle goes. And so sometimes people do best on seven hours of sleep, whereas other women, if they don't get the eight or nine hours of sleep, they just feel wrecked. And so you know, I think the easiest thing for those women is just allow yourself to sleep longer. I mean, our days are getting darker. Allow yourself to sort of go with the cycle of, of daylight. And I feel like that is one of the most important things that I address with patients is that just sleep when you're supposed to be sleeping yeah. and, you know, don't fight that and stay up late because your body can get the second wind. And then you're all of a sudden awake at 10 o'clock at night. And you're like, Ooh, I have another three hours. And then you start the cycle over the next day where you wake up, you peel yourself off the mattress and you're exhausted. Yeah, that's um, the sleep thing is interesting because certainly that's a foundation for where energy levels can come from. And I do find that a lot of women, especially as they're in perimenopause um, and postmenopause, they are also, I used to be able to be fine on five or six hours of sleep. Now I can't do that. So in that case, they were they aren't even they were never meeting um, what's recommended for optimal sleep, and now it feels harder. Um, so for them, you, like you said, giving them giving themselves permission to sleep in a little bit later or take a nap when you're tired is actually working with your body's rhythm and can help give you more energy. There's a little double-edged sword to that, though, as mm -hmm. well, because if you talk to sleep doctors and you're having sleep issues, the last thing they want you to do is take a nap. Mm, because okay. then you're sleeping during the day and then when it's time to go to bed. So that's obviously something that a 20 minute nap can be a great thing, but a two hour nap is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, good, good point on that little a balance around the napping piece. Exactly, you know, and we have whole talks on sleep, but I think it's important that, you know, I'm, I'm approaching 47 and I'm getting hot. And mm. even if I'm not fully having hot flashes, my thermal regulatory light range is much narrower. And so if I'm not in my own room, that's dark with my own bedding, with the window open, I have a really hard time sleeping in other places. And mm. one night of lost sleep is really sets you up for fatigue moving forward. And so it's just, you know, sleep, having a good sleep environment is really important for energy as well. But I can't stress enough that you may need to sleep more, you know, you may have higher requirements for sleep, but it's, you know, it's one of the biggest things in fatigue is that we're just not sleeping enough or we're having an altered sleep rhythm. Um, stress, I mean, I think stress keeps a lot of people awake and whether you use cognitive behavioral therapy in an app um, or whether you talk to someone like Stacy and some sort of coach that can help you. I think that a lot of us, if we don't have some sort of way to manage our stress and we don't get good sleep, then of course that participates in fatigue. So that's a big one. Um, I think some of the other things um, are lack of movement or not getting enough exercise. And I think that more and more people are sitting in front of their computers all day long. And even with the shortened day, it's the end of the day, they've not got out, gotten outside. And so I, I really feel like movement, especially outside is a really important, of just important part of one, not having anxiety, but two, just having energy throughout the day. We weren't meant to sit here all day. 
And mm -hmm. so a lot of us, our jobs are now very computer focused. And I think that plays a huge part in fatigue. And we live in the Northwest up here and people say, oh, well in the summer, I like to do this, that and the other, but you know, with gyms being closed and a lot of our exercise options not being available to us, we have to get creative when we have to get out of our houses and we have to spend some time outside, whether rain or shine, you just have to have the right gear and, and do it anyway. Yeah, no, the, um, the activity piece is a great one. And that's the one too, where I have a lot of clients who know they have more energy, they feel more energy when they are able to move um, consistently and especially they can get outside. They notice that specifically. And if they're constantly tired, that becomes harder to do. So there is this breaking of the cycle. And I think that comes back to what you talked about structure. How can you have as some level of structure in your day, in your week that keeps you doing things at relatively the same times. So that just becomes the routine your body's used to. Yeah. And I, I think that exercise earlier in the day, mm -hmm. a lot of my patients say, if I don't exercise in the morning, I'm just spent by the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, me, I prefer to exercise in the afternoon, but I've really tried to have to, you know, I take my dog for a walk in the morning. because just that outdoor time in the morning, even when it's dark, um, is really important for me to have the energy to go through my day so I can get through the day so that I can do the exercise that actually I need, which is more mm -hmm. aggressive than walking my dog. So. Yeah. No, I think that's a good point. I do. Um, and that client I talked to last week, she said the same thing that she was finding, she wanted to do something in the morning to get moving, but she really wasn't in the, the frame of mind to, or had the time even to do the extent of the extra vigorous exercise she wanted, but she started just riding her bike around her neighborhood for about 15 minutes. And she said her day was so much better. She was able to focus. And then later on in the afternoon, um, she did a longer, more intense bike ride. Yeah. And, and, you know, exercise looks different for different people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the research has shown that walking is an excellent, it's an excellent exercise and we don't have to go out and sprint. We don't have to do a Peloton 45 minute bike ride. You know, we don't have to do that. We just need to move our bodies. So mm -hmm. And another thing that's great for stress management, that exercise piece, uh, like you said, getting outside can help with anxiety and that release of energy. You know, when you're feeling um, anxious or feeling stressed, sometimes that outlet through moving your body can be a great way to release that and feel better going back to your day or um, ending your day or starting your day, either one. Yeah, and I think one thing that you told me about, um, you know, we use each other for resources and, mm -hmm. I was stuck and I was looking to Stacy for some advice, which was funny. She's like, why, you know what to do. And I'm like, I just need you to keep me accountable. <laughs> so I actually do it. But one thing is that, you know, we tend to prop ourselves up with caffeine, you know, whether it's diet Pepsis or Coke or sugar or, you know, cups of coffee, you know, quadruple shots of, you know, whatever. And I feel like the more tired you are and the more you use props, they sort of set you up for a high and then a crash. But when it comes to me, I try to avoid eating sugars and things like that. But I feel like if you take them out 100% and you don't allow yourself to ever have them, then you sort of binge on them and that's not healthy either. And so one thing that I found is if I'm feeling kind of, if I'm dragging, then having a little bit of sugary something or a piece of fruit or a Lara bar before I exercise just gives me what I need to actually go get it done. So then I have more energy later on. Yeah, so absolutely. Feeds into that. I'm too tired to exercise. And so if you can use a little bit of healthy fuel to give you the energy to go get that done, it really does mm -hmm. make a difference. Yeah. And then you can feel better while you're doing the exercise too. going into exercise, especially if you are a morning exercise person and not having any, you know, you've been fasting all night and then you go into that exercise session. It may not feel that great, especially if you are doing something that's going to be a little bit higher intensity, you could probably be fine walking. Um, but if you really are going to be pushing yourself and then that session doesn't feel great, it's going to be harder to try to do it again. So then incorporating that exercise regularly becomes more of a challenge. Yeah.
Yeah, excellent. So I think we beat that one to death. All right, exercise. So we talked about sleep. We talked about sleep. Um, let's go back to a little bit on the stress management. You did mention some things in terms of having um, an app available or working with someone to provide accountability. Um, we're in a high stress time. Pandemics, elections. There's a lot going on right now. Um, what do you? If we could give a little synopsis on what stress, how does stress play into fatigue? And then what are some other ways we can support our body's ability to manage that stress? Yeah, so as far as stress goes, I mean, the physiologic response for stress is the cortisol levels rising. Mm -hmm. And so if cortisol levels continue to be high, it creates weight gain around the middle. It creates this high cortisol in the evening, which doesn't allow us to get good restorative sleep. And so having ways to manage your stress. Everyone has different methods of stress release. And for me, it's being out in nature and exercising and running on trails. For someone else, it could be knitting. It could be, you know, crafting. It could be, you know, working in your wood shop. It could be so many different things, but something that sort of gets your mind away from the things that are tormenting you, whether it be finances, relationships, you know, the sort of body changes. I think a lot of women ruminate about getting older and seeing their body change and really trying to fight it. And I feel like we spend a lot of time worrying about that. And then when we're worried, we're basically laying in bed. And I feel like at, as menopause, as women approach menopause, there's a lot of that. They lay in bed and they're uncomfortable and they just lay there and they think about all the things that they need to do or the things that aren't being done or how am I going to meet, you know, the financial requirements to, to stay afloat. And I feel like having some sort of stress release that gets your mind off all those things is a really important part of getting good sleep, which of course will reduce your fatigue. Um, but some of the apps that I feel have been really helpful for people, because I feel like a lot of people don't just know how to go into a room and meditate. I mean, if you've done that before, you don't need tools or props to do that, but the majority of people have never really done that before. And so I do feel like having a guide through that is helpful. And so there's apps like Calm, the Calm app, and even Peloton, you know, the Peloton app. I've been recommending that a lot lately because it's got yoga, it's got meditation. You don't have to have a Peloton bike to use the app. It's got like great core courses if you want to work on your abs, you know, but mainly it's got, you know, a lot of things, uh, something for everyone. Mm -hmm. And then there's the CBTI, that's the cognitive behavioral therapy with a dash with a little I, and then the word coach. That is a really good way to, instead of saying, okay, I'm going to take Ambien to help me fall asleep so I can have good sleep. So I feel rested in the morning, which usually people don't, they wake up in a haze. Mm -hmm. um, they can use cognitive behavioral therapy to really get better quality of sleep, which will reduce the fatigue because just like we use props during the day to increase our energy when we're fatigued, those have side effects and the medications that we often use to help us sleep there's been really a lot of clinical studies on those that at least in the first couple weeks, maybe months that those can work effectively, but then they stop working for sleep. So it really mm -hmm. comes down to behavior change. And mm -hmm. that's where cognitive behavioral therapy comes in handy because it really helps you hone in on the things that you aren't doing or you're doing too much of. So you can make that change so you can, you know, basically have better stress management, better sleep management. Yeah. And all of these do come back to, okay, what is the root cause of the sleep, uh, of poor sleep? Um, or what is the root cause of the stress? How can you identify that and work on addressing that root cause versus just constantly treating symptoms, um, which is really going to catch up with you in the long run, which I think is what most women are experiencing when they get to this point of extreme fatigue. Yeah. And honestly, behavior change is the hardest thing, you know, mm -hmm. it's, many times patients come in and they, you know, they, they want the supplement, they want the medication, you know, mm -hmm. they, they want what's quick because they're so tired. Mm -hmm. um, but usually it's a foundational lifestyle thing that they're not doing that right. needs help. And so that's when, you know, that's when using someone like Stacy and the health fix program can be really great because 
it's great to go into your doctor and say, okay, here's my list of things to do. And then, you know, you could be going back three months later, six months later, mm -hmm. but unless there's someone there that can help implement the change or to sort of remind you to circle back when you haven't been successful, I think that's a huge part in improving fatigue to have someone sort of navigate all the things that you need to consider and then helping you really make those changes to improve your quality of life because it's really hard to do on your own. Yeah, that's another good point of um, giving yourself permission to ask for help. I think a lot of women right now too um, that I see, they haven't asked for help in a lot of areas of their life and they've always been able to do it all. And now all of a sudden it just feels harder um, combination of either they're taking on more and they've reached their max or they have been doing it so long and there really is this true fatigue that's setting in that makes everything feel a lot heavier right now. Yeah. So I think there's also, there's a lot to be said for self-acceptance mm -hmm. with how things are changing. And, yeah. you know, we can't be, you know, like for me, I can't go out and stay out late two nights in a row. Like I just can't do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay with that. You know, right. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to plan to, you know, and I think about, oh, I'm only 47 years old and wow, that's kind of amazing that I can't really go out and stay up really late two nights in a row, but I'm kind of like, that's okay. Cause I really prefer my mornings. And so mm -hmm. I think it's a time to reevaluate too, to be like, what are the most important things and how do I make space for those under the current parameters of my, you know, my circadian rhythm or how much I can get done in a day. Yeah. No, that's so. such a good point. And to be, and like you said, that acceptance piece of, while maybe it is there are, is some level of disappointment or, or maybe even grief from what used to be, but then realizing, um, you know, this is this is the amount of energy you have. How can you make the most of it? And reprioritizing, um, and then celebrating the things that you can do. You can still stay out one night uh, per week, and you can enjoy your mornings, um, and you can enjoy going to bed. <laughs> you know, a lot of women right now do, and they can get to bed and they can get good sleep. How good it does feel. For them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I, I found myself being like, wow, it's kind of sad that going to bed is like one of my favorite parts of the day. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, um, if, it could be, if it could be providing you with a better day the next day, there's something to be said for that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But let's not miss out on the, you know, the things that are worrisome for fatigue, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of people go into their doctor or they just don't feel heard or the doctor's like you're getting older mm. you know just get used to it and so if someone comes in for fatigue with me I mean obviously I check in on the physiologic things and the, the basic lifestyle things like the sleep the exercise the stress like we definitely check in on those and mm. I think it's really important that your doctor does check in on those um depression depression mm. is a huge factor in fatigue and I feel like life is really hard right now. We're like in the entire world, like we're all in this, you know, no one is left out really. Um, and there's a lot of depression happening and sometimes untreated depression fatigue is the most important symptom. And, you know, it's kind of a delicate situation because people never want to admit they have depression. But if you think about menopause and depression specifically, so as we go through menopause, our estrogen levels decline. We know there's a direct correlation with estrogen and serotonin. Serotonin is what we're all trying to increase when we're taking antidepressants. And so if you think about not having enough estrogen and your, ser and your serotonin is declining as well, sometimes antidepressants are life-changing for people. Mm -hmm. and, and patients, it's almost like you have to tread very lightly around that because no one wants to admit that they're depressed but at the same time, depression is a very serious medical condition that can really affect not only your quality of life, but your longevity. Mm. And so being screened for depression with your doctor and being treated for depression is a really important part because it's really oftentimes what's happening when there's fatigue. And um, other things that I tend to screen for because thyroid function really does decline over time. And so I always check thyroid function Oftentimes doctors will say, oh, your thyroid function's normal, but there is a pretty wide reference range for thyroid function. So it's just really important to know, like maybe I, instead of being at the 
high end of the of the normal range for thyroid and it's kind of complicated but there's one hormone called the thyroid stimulating hormone which tells your thyroid to make more hormones so the higher that value is the lower your thyroid function is so checking your thyroid function or if you've been heading into menopause and you've been bleeding a lot and you're iron deficient or you have fibroids like iron deficiency is a huge cause of fatigue and sometimes the bleeding stops, but you're still iron deficient and your body hasn't responded to that. And so you can check a ferritin level in the blood to see whether your iron storage is fine. And then we also need to check for cardiovascular function. Like we, we know our cardiovascular disease increases significantly at, after heading into menopause and untreated cardiovascular disease, you know, you could have reduced cardiac function and that could be seen as fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, Lack of vitamin D, vitamin D levels. I, you know, I saw one today that was an 18 and the normal, the very low end of the normal is 30. And so having low vitamin D can make someone very tired and very depressed. Um, you know, our kids, <laughs> back to kids. And, you know, it's like, we're, we're in this challenging time where I don't know if it's like a curse, but women are going to menopause while their children are in high school, generally speaking, for the most part. And kids at that age are really demanding and we worry about them and they're driving cars and, you know, it's, they're coming in later than we even stay up sometimes. And so having kids and having aging parents, I mean, there's a lot of stress. And even if people are like, I manage my stress really well, even if they have a lot of stress, it still can impact you physiologically and just make you feel fatigued. Right. Yeah, no, that's all again, it's, it's complicated. There's usually never just one thing. Uh, thank you for pointing out all of the potential physiological things that may need further testing to evaluate and treat that can be playing a role in fatigue. Um, if a patient is uh, working with a physician and maybe they have um, concerns around anxiety, depression, uh, but it is a hard thing to talk about. Mental health uh, does have a stigma in our, our culture and society. Do you have any recommendations if they're coming to you, one of our telemedicine providers or a primary care physician, how to start that conversation? You know, I mean, hopefully you have a doctor that you feel comfortable talking with. Um, and I, I think that something's been lost in our medical culture where sometimes, you know, you don't get to see the same doctor for a longer period of time, or they don't know you historically over the years. Um, because I, you know, I'm fortunate that I've been in Seattle and practice since 2005. And so a lot of the patients that I've seen over the course of the lifetime you know, I, I just see it in them, you mm -hmm. know, or now we're having all these video conferences and it's been really interesting to, you know, you're, for me, you can see like, you know, this much of my office and I can see you in your office and but sometimes patients show up for their visits and they just look disheveled or, you know, they're just not, you know, their hair is crazy and they're like, oh, you know, you know, but you see in the background that their house is sort of, disarray or you know they're constantly late for their appointment or there's a no-show and so for me I see signs that I need to be more um, sensitive to patients but you know I, I feel like if you have a good doctor you should be able to talk to that doctor about anything and I also feel like I hope doctors are asking patients about their stress and depression but I think most of them are because we know how much of a factor it is in so many disease states, including Alzheimer's. And as women going into menopause, like we worry about our cognitive function. And mm -hmm. so, and it's interesting because I've had people come in really worried about their cognitive function. And one of the most important things to rule out is depression. Mm. And so, um, so that's one of the things like, you know, just talking about like you're, you're tired. It's really hard to get out of bed or you just don't find the joy in things that you did before. And I feel like if you can't talk to your doctor about those things, then it's probably time to find a different doctor that you actually feel comfortable talking to about. Yeah, such a good point. Um, and, and it all comes back to advocating for your own health needs too. And certainly as we've discussed today with depression playing a role in energy levels and fatigue, if you wanna feel better, you gotta get to that, that root cause um, of the depression. And there's plenty of options to do that with um, medication being one of those options that's definitely viable.
Yeah, and I, I can't stress enough, there's a lot of my patients who I'm like, you need a counselor mm -hmm. because we can't, like, we can't give our kids away. You know, they have to go to school. <laughs> right. We can't quit our jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be great if we could just stay home and make amazing food and, mm -hmm. you know, do classes and exercise and make pottery, but most of us can't do that. And so I think there's a lot to be said for not necessarily being able to change a lot of things that bring mm -hmm. us exhaustion and fatigue and depression but being able to have someone that can help you sort of see the forest through the trees or you mm -hmm. know and, and basically say okay here's how you can break this down right and you know help you figure out how to navigate through it when you can't change some of those things yeah again another area where um giving yourself permission to ask for help, especially because those resources are there. Uh, professional, unbiased party, certainly friends and family are a great support and you want to have those to be able to reach out to too. But someone that's not uh, not related to you or connected to you um, can definitely be you know that outsider that can provide that insight and professional guidance. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of patients who are not comfortable you know, expressing their concerns about things, those mm -hmm. patients, I encourage them to sort of put a list together before their appointment, mm -hmm. just so they don't forget that stuff, you know, especially you come in and you're tired, if you don't have a prepared list of things to ask about, mm -hmm. and you sort of leave and you're like, darn, you know, I, I didn't, and, and some primary care offices are really hard. Like the other day, I tried to call my primary care's office and even just the whole family practice, I was number 35 in the oh, phone wow. queue, you oh know, my goodness. Like, wow, you know, and there's a lot of portals that you can use to, to use, to call and ask questions or, you know, not to call, but to, you know, type a message in and that can be helpful, but there's a lot of people who don't like to use those. They like to talk to someone. Um, and so being prepared is really important. Good point there. Um, just looking at my list here to see other things. Um, so another consideration is, you know, most of us, by the time we reach menopause, we've started to collect, maybe be on a medication or two. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important things is, is one of your medications creating a side effect of fatigue or mm -hmm. does it deplete nutrients? So birth control pills, many women spend decades on birth control pills. Mm -hmm. Those significantly reduce our B vitamin levels. And mm -hmm. A lot of women are on statin medications or blood pressure medications, which can deplete our CoQ10 levels, which is the nutrient that gives our mitochondria fuel. And so mm -hmm. if you're on medications, looking into your medications to determine if that could be playing a role in fatigue, obviously you don't want to stop them without talking to your doctor, but you could talk to your doctor or your pharmacist um, to determine are there nutrient deficiencies associated mm -hmm. with taking this medication. That's a good point. Yeah, sometimes those things um, get overlooked. Or is it possible if someone's been taking a medication, maybe they don't have those side effects at first and they come on later in life? Is that something that's common? Yeah, that is really common, actually, because, you know, usually nutrient deficiencies, secondary to medications occur mm -hmm. over the course of time. Okay, that makes sense. So, you know, versus like some people are very averse to statin medications. And if they take a medication that's going to immediately give them a side effect, they usually notice it within the first couple of days to weeks. Mm -hmm. But long term medications, um, usually, you know, it accumulates over decades. Okay. So important to check that. Well, you mentioned nutrients. Um, let's jump into nutrition a little bit here, because that certainly we know that that's important for energy um, with what we're eating. That's how we that's how we get energy is from our food. Um, what do you see typically with your patients that, from a nutrition standpoint, maybe gaps that are common for women? not having optimal energy related to food. Yeah, there's a few patterns I see a lot of. So I see a lot of women feeling like they put a lot of effort into eating well during the day, but mm -hmm. the stress of the day catches up with them and they're tired and they just lose all sense of willpower. I don't know if that's the right word, but you know, it's like you have these good intentions during the day and you eat your, you know, oatmeal and then you have an apple for a snack and then you eat a salad and then you go home and you're cooking and cleaning and you know trying to do all this stuff and then you're you know as working people um you know there's a lot to do after you get home from work and I think a lot of people rely on wine 
<laughs> now they're tired. They, you know, they know there's a lot more things to do before they can go to bed. Mm -hmm. So women start drinking, especially in the COVID times, people start <laughs> drinking and that affects their energy levels the next day. I know yeah. that the older I get, even if I don't feel like I've overindulged, even just one or two glasses of wine the next day, and I just feel a little hazy. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing women do, and, and men too, is that they finally put away the dishes and it's ready to relax and they sit in front of the television and they mindlessly just like eat the carbs and the salts and the chocolates. And then they eat all these things at nighttime and eating at nighttime definitely impact sleep in a negative way for most people. Um, and so those are common things that people do, or they just feel so tired that they don't have the energy to prepare the food that they need for good health. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we're always trying to consider the environment, but you know, you just have to meet people where they're at sometimes. And so I encourage them just go to the grocery store and get those prepackaged salad mix that have like the nuts and the, you know, all you need in the dressing and just, you know, make it easy, buy a roast chicken and cut some of that and put that on top. But I think people get tired and then they gravitate to the fast foods. Mm -hmm. They're hugely high in carbohydrates, fats, you know, sugars, and they're just not feeling well because they're not fueling their bodies appropriately. And it's, I think that's when I refer people more often to dietitians to help them figure out what's the best way to eat that will fit into the lifestyle of the patient. Because, you know, you're not going to say, oh, you need to cook all your meals and do this daily harvest breakfast. And, you know, people are tired. They're just like, cut it, make it easy for me. Yeah, exactly. No, that's, and I noticed that too. And then, and then it's the cycle. Then they want, um, then they, they say, well, I didn't eat well today, so I'll start next week. So they do a week of fast food, convenience foods, and then it's, um, it just keeps perpetuating that way. And then they feel worse and worse. Yeah, I know. It's, I, I kind of consider, you know, menopause and pregnancy, <laughs> it's kind of the same in some ways because yeah you're so tired and, you know, you used to be like, oh, I'll get into menopause. And then it's just, you know, I, I, I feel like things are different in my practice where I have mm -hmm. these women who, you know, they're health optimizers, they're frustrated with body changes and they're like, how can I maintain what I was doing at 35? But I think a lot of other people are just like, they want to throw in the towel and they're mm -hmm. like, it doesn't matter what I eat. I just keep gaining weight and I'm mm -hmm. tired and I'm depressed and just getting them out of that cycle is really important. And yeah. so I try to encourage sometimes the, the late night eaters, I try to encourage them towards the prolonged nightly fasting to mm -hmm. say, you know, it's not that you're hungry because you just had dinner. You just mm -hmm. need to break that cycle. And so say, if you, if you need to have a snack at nighttime, just have an apple or something that's low glycemic, that's not going to completely keep you awake in the middle of the night, you mm -hmm. know, or, have a cup of tea that has licorice root in it. So it's a little bit sweet, you know, mm -hmm. sort of, it's warm, it's comforting. It takes a long time to drink that tea because it's hot. And so I just need to reprogram our bodies because it is cognitive behavioral therapy most of the time. You know, you're like, it's after dinner. This is when I sit down and eat popcorn, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just, we just sort of retrain ourselves away from those habits that we develop. Yeah, and taking a look at also the eating throughout the day. I do have a lot of clients that they say I was I was good all day and then I get home at night and I just I I'm starving and I just eat, you know, I'm snacking when I'm making dinner and then I'm snacking after dinner. When I ask what does good all day look like, it means having a small breakfast, maybe a, a lunch, maybe a salad for lunch, and then nothing till dinner. So there's these huge gaps where they probably didn't eat enough. They didn't eat the combinations of foods that provide satiety, like your high fiber carbohydrates. So your fruits, your vegetables, your whole grains with a protein source. So then of course, by the time you get home, when you're also combined with fatigue, then it's going to be really hard to not just grab for the chips or the ice cream because your body wants quick energy and it's really yeah. smart and figuring out a way to do that. 
Yeah. And I will say there's a lot of people who, you know, they'll do the paleo diet mm -hmm. and they're like, I feel amazing while doing this, which is usually not sustained. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like a lot of people are really on this no carb or low carb mm -hmm. sort of trajectory and they're tired and they're depressed, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and they're constipated. And so it's not that I'm advocating for breads and pastas and the chips, you know, obviously it's good to have those things on occasion. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about complex carbohydrates like lentils or beans or sweet potatoes, mm -hmm. you know, or even like a roasted cauliflower, you know, some of those starchy vegetables, because there's a way to eat healthy carbohydrates that aren't going to put weight on. Cause I think most people are concerned with weight and then they're like, oh, I'm, I'm gaining weight. So I'm going to cut all the carbs and your mental health and your, you know, your, you need carbohydrates for energy mm -hmm. and it's good to have carbohydrates that have fiber and protein or combined with fiber, protein and healthy fats. But it's, it's a, it's a whole matter of combining those. Mm -hmm. So you have sustained energy throughout the day instead of running on fumes and then getting home and then just everything going out the window and eating all the cheese and crackers and olives while you're cooking and drinking the wine and then you have your dinner and then after your dinner you're like I need something sweet and then your cortisol is really high because you just ate all this food and then your body needs to create a bunch of insulin mm -hmm. to pull that all that sugar in and then all of a sudden you're still wide awake and you're like why and it's directly related to eating all that stuff late at night. Right. Yeah. Again, the, those cycles with that um, shift in the routine. Um, some I, kind of a ballpark um, that I'll give clients at times is thinking about eating approximately every three to four hours throughout the day. Now, sometimes that's going to fit. Sometimes it's not. It doesn't mean that if it's three hours since your last meal that you have to eat something, but it's almost like checking in. Are you hungry at that point? Um, or sometimes you may notice, wow, I'm starving. And you realize, oh, it's been six hours since my last meal. Well, that's normal hunger. Um, that doesn't mean that you're you're losing weight. Hunger doesn't equate to weight loss in that way. Um, it means that your body's giving you a signal that something that it needs. Um, and that's a great time to get that complex carbohydrate and a protein source um, or a meal if it's time for you to have a meal. Yeah. And I, I do think it's good because I, you know, not to always bring this back to weight, mm -hmm. but, you know, fatigue, hot flashes, weight, those are the things that I tend to have the biggest complaints from, from patients. And if you're not eating enough, then your metabolic rate slows down mm -hmm. because your body is like, well, I'm starving. You know, I must have, I'm going to save my energy for this, you know, amount of period of time when I'm not going to eat. Your body mm -hmm. doesn't know that there's food over there. You know, our body is just, and so I see a lot of patients who are, are fatigued and they're aiming for weight loss, but they're not losing weight because they're not eating regularly. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also the people who sort of eat throughout the whole day. And I feel like that's really hard too, unless you like measure out like pumpkin seeds or, you know, when you have it there or, you know, you have some, I always try to have snacks on my desk. So I'm, you know, if I'm hungry or tired, I can grab some whole food. Mm -hmm. So I am not like finding myself at home starving, you know, eating a bunch of things that I never intended to eat because I waited too long. Right. And then you make all the wrong choices. So yeah, that's structure and routine, but getting strategic with your, your fueling as well. Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. And one question you had um, on this was like, when is the fatigue concerning? Like yeah. when should I really be concerned about the fatigue? And I think this comes down to, you know, a lot of us have put off our screening exams with COVID. People aren't going for lab tests. I heard an article in the Journal of American Medical Association that breast cancer diagnoses are down 53% mm. because women aren't doing their screening exams. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, even though fatigue can be this sort of tangible feeling, but, you know, nothing on paper there's still a lot of important lab tests that you can do to address that. And so doing a CBC, um, a complete blood count, one to see if you're iron deficient, but check on your white blood cell counts um, because fatigue could be something more 
dangerous, you know, and you can also do a metabolic panel, which looks at your glucose level and your liver function and your kidney function. So those are important things to check. Um, but if you're unable to get out of bed, you know, or if you're canceling all kinds of events and you're, you know, not showing up for things, if you can't do your job, you know, those, those are the concerning things when like a lot of people have fatigue, but they, but they're able to do all the things anyway, they're just doing it with like low grade fatigue. But if the fatigue is so significant that it's impacting your quality of life and your work and your relationships with others, that's when it's concerning. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for pointing that out and really making sure people know, like if you're experiencing those, that's really when it's important to reach out to a physician um, to get support and find out the next best steps for you based off of whatever diagnosis or test that they run. Yeah. Well, let's um, finish up. You had also mentioned Vitality, um, the R, um, R supplement that you helped create. And you were talking about some of the nutrients in there being important or deciding to put some of those in there based off of what um, women need during this time of life of menopause to support their energy levels. So what it, what does, let's start with Vitality and then maybe uh, finish up with some other supplements that maybe women should consider related to energy or um, having enough uh, energy throughout the day? Yeah, so Vitality was created um, really based on the most common nutrients that I was prescribing to patients, combined with clinical research on which nutrients are most frequently deficient in this you know, age group of women. Mm -hmm. And you know, generally women over 40. Um, and so, you know, that's how I sort of came up with the ingredients that I was going to use in that um, because again, you know, all these nutrients, it's not a pharmaceutical, it's something you can get over the counter, but they made a big clinical difference in how people feel. And so um, this is Vitality actually. Um, and it comes in these really easy to, oh, I only have one left to reorder. Um, comes in these little packets and it's five capsules, which some people are like, oh my gosh, five capsules. But um, one of the most important, they're bright yellow, as you can see, and patients often say, oh my gosh, they have, a, they have an odor to them. Um, but honestly, if you're taking a supplement and it doesn't have an odor, then I would really question what's in that supplement. Um, but B vitamins are one of the most important nutrients in here. B vitamins are really important in cellular function. They're really important in our mood, they're really important in our energy levels. And so B vitamins are in here. And generally, if you've been taking a birth control pill, you know, over the course of your lifetime, um, or an antidepressant, those are two things that really deplete our B vitamins. So those are the ingredients in here. Um, vitamin D is also in here because vitamin D is super important, not only for your energy, but also your bone density. It's also in this time where we're concerned about flu and COVID, vi vitamin D has been shown to be one of the most impactful things against viruses. Um, the other thing that's in here is N-acetylcysteine. Again, really important for virus protection. And um, not there's a lot of supplements. When we were sort of researching other companies creating supplements, a lot of them have a lot of ingredients, but very little of, of each individual ingredient. So if you read the label, you're like, wow, that's so impressive, but it's got not a therapeutic dosage. And so part of the goal with Vitality was keep it down to a manageable amount of capsules, but also put a therapeutic dose of each particular nutrient that we're using. 600 milligrams of N-acetylcysteine, which is a powerful antioxidant. Um, you can also get a lot of those nutrients by eating cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, bok choy, uh, Brussels sprouts. Of course, a lot of those are available right now. Um, selenium is in here, which is really important for thyroid health. Mm. Vitamin A, which is really important for eye health. I know a lot of women go into menopause and their, their vision changes. It's also a really good antiviral. Uh, CoQ10, which is the nutrient I mentioned earlier that tends to be depleted over time, secondary to statins um, and blood pressure medications. Uh, biotin, which of course many people are really focused on hair and nails. And so, you know, not that we want to be vain, but often mm -hmm. women are vain around this time because things are changing so rapidly. 
And so, you know, for me, oh, there's some vitamin E in here as well. And magnesium, magnesium is really important for sleep, really important for stress. Vitamin E is a really important antioxidant as well. But really, um, I've never been a great supplement taker, but I will say I've been really good about taking Vitality because I actually feel better. I mean, you put a bunch of nutrients in a capsule and you hope for the best, but it's really great to actually have people taking it and saying, actually, this is making me feel better. And it should because it is focused on the nutrients that we need as a population as we head into this postmenopausal era. Yeah. No, that's such a good point. And I like how you called out the therapeutic dose part. I will say that some clients, again, they're like five capsules. This is so much, but then just breaking it down, explaining that their woman's multivitamin that they were taking, it's probably not hurting them, but they're getting like sprinkles of everything that's in there. So is it really having the impact that they're hoping for? Yes. I forgot one of the most important ingredients and that's the curcumin. Mm. So, um, which also is yellow, but that women often experience fatigue because they just, even their bodies feel tired. There's one thing about the brain fatigue, but there's the body fatigue. And Mm -hmm. curcumin is a really important anti-inflammatory and it's really good for cognitive function. And there's actually 500 milligrams of curcumin Mm -hmm. in this. And so, you know, I'm actually really surprised at how much we were able to pack into those (laughs) little capsules. Um, but you know, it's like body pain is exhausting. Mm -hmm. And so if you can take curcumin and reduce your body pain, you'll feel so much better. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, a lot of things that we've covered today, um, on fatigue that can influence fatigue at energy levels, and then strategies that, um, women can focus on implementing to help have more energy um, or help to minimize that fatigue. What, um, what do you have for final remarks or closing thoughts for our listeners that you want them to take away from today? Yeah. So I was thinking our checklist of things we reviewed would be a great way to pull things together. Mm -hmm. Um, So check into your sleep, make sure you're getting good sleep and make sure you're getting at least seven to nine hours of sleep. And if you feel like that's too much, it may not be, you know, Mm -hmm. you may just need that much sleep eating a clean diet, not eating too late at night, making sure you're not propping yourself up with caffeine and sugar, which is going to, or alcohol, which is going to later make you more tired. Mm -hmm. Um, Getting movement, getting exercise is so important. So really the foundational things that you can control day to day, which is kind of hard because it's a new day and you still have to follow these darn recommendations. But at the same time, they're the really important recommendations for every aspect of our health. Mm -hmm. And then looking into making sure that it's not depression, writing a list of things to ask your doctor to make sure you talk about those things, making sure you have a doctor that you can feel comfortable talking to. At Genev, we have so many different practitioners that you can talk to within our program. Not every doctor is someone that you can connect with, but somewhere out there, there is that person you can connect with. So feel free to ask for a referral. Um, Getting lab work done, mainly checking your thyroid function, checking your iron levels, checking a CBC, your basic liver function, kidney function, just staying on top of all those screening exams, including colonoscopies and mammograms, all of those things. And then... Um, looking to see if any of your medications may have side effects that could create fatigue. And then lastly, um, supplements that can make a difference in how you feel. So I'd say the things that I recommended, of course, there's all these adaptogen herbs and things like that. But generally, I like to really treat fatigue holistically and not just throw supplements at it, because generally, it's something that you're doing you're not doing that's participating in, in your overall fatigue. So Excellent. if you go in and someone puts you on five or six different supplements to treat your fatigue and hasn't asked about your lifestyle or your quality of life or your mental health, it's really important that those things are, are you know, talked about. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And if anyone's interested in learning more about adaptogens, we have a webinar on that so they could go to our <laughs> YouTube channel um, and yeah, dive into that. One. <laughs> and the sleep, exactly. So plenty of things to go a little bit deeper on the topics we talked about today. And Wendy, if any of our listeners or viewers want to work with you or get in touch with you, how would they do that? Yeah, so I do telemedicine Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Um, just 
half day on either one of those days, they can always schedule an appointment with me then. Um, and there's plenty of uh, if you go to the Genev website and you click on the learn tab, there are so many different ways that you can look at the things that Stacy and I have talked about together. Um, you can also find me at drwendyellis.com. Excellent. Um, and if you are interested in working with any of our registered dietitians um, to fine tune any of the strategies we talked about today, uh, sign up for our health fix program. You can do that on our website as well. And then we also, as Wendy mentioned, um, we do have a variety of practitioners. So uh, Wendy is our naturopathic uh, physician in, if you're in Oregon and Washington. Um, and then we also have um, OBGYNs that are all, all have training specifically in menopause pause and you can um, sign up for a telemedicine appointment for them with them and they can also help you with other areas of fatigue so no reason to be exhausted um, and suffering in silence it's definitely something that um, if you're in that position reach out ask for help and there are resources to support you thanks for listening all right thank you everyone